1 Corinthians 2. Whew, no wonder. I'm like, I didn't study that. Sorry. And when I came to you, brethren, here we go, see? I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now right here, this is Paul, the Apostle Paul. The one who authorized the killing of many Christians. Who has now, at this point, become saved and is now preaching the gospel. But he's very clear to tell us that he really wasn't a good speaker. He didn't come with eloquent words or anything fancy. But two things. Jesus Christ and him crucified. That was his message. It's so clear here. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Why? That your faith should not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. He says this so cleanly and plainly so that they don't misunderstand that coming after Paul was going to be wisdom from men. People were going to add to the Bible what they wanted for their purpose, their benefit, and for their profit. The Bible says this. We'll cover some of that in a couple of, uh, weeks. That your faith should not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. Do you see? There's your context. He could speak in eloquence. He could speak mature things. But he has to wait. Why do you think when I came to the rock, I didn't start with this? Because mentally wise, they were not there. Maturity wise. We had to start with baby steps. You know how popular it is to start a doctrinal church today? Not very popular. It would be easier for me to start a community church with all kinds of funds and programs and games, but I'm not in this for that. I'm in this to make disciples. And when he said, we're going to start this ministry of yours, you're ready, but we need to start with the basics so that when you get to the advanced things, they don't get confused. Because today, there likes to be confusion. The enemy loves to confuse. Matter of fact, he'll even, the enemy will bring advanced doctrine into houses of worship for those that can't handle it, just to confuse them, to sound smart, to sound good. And we don't do that here. We've got to make sure that we understand the whole realm of God. Not just one part of it. But any time we teach the Bible, we need to make sure that we're teaching it to the audience who can understand it. Could you imagine, what if I went to a congregation, people who were brand, all brand new believers, never heard anything about the Bible, and I began to talk to them about sanctification and justification. It would go over their head. Matter of fact, do you know that even some of the things I taught in the beginning of, my, of, of, of this ministry that God has given me, that I used to talk about things that were over their head and I didn't even realize it? Until someone once said to me, look, you're in a small town. You need to put things a little bit simpler for them to understand. Well, I could have gone the other edge and then just made everything all baby and milky. But I had to understand the congregation. Once I understood who you were and what you knew, it was a piece of cake. Because then I knew where I could, I, I began to test the waters 
Bible says test the spirits, but I tend to test the waters to make sure that you know you're all right, that you're not going to fall, and you know I don't want that to happen. Continuing on. Now watch this. This is fascinating. Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. Who's the ruler of this age? Who? And he's passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom, which God predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us God revealed them through what? The Spirit. How did he... Now wait, this is written already. But we're reading it, let's just say with a fresh set of eyes today. You might have read the scripture before. But it says here, for to us. For to us. God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. Now let me ask you a question. If God has revealed it already, but it's new to us, who did he reveal it to and when? Any idea? I mean, we can deduce, right, that it was revealed. It was given to them already. Can you tell me when it was given and where it was given and to whom it was given? I know that's three. Right here. But before this, who was it given to? Them. Us. It was given to them. Now, someone must have been taking good notes. They must have been teaching like uh, shorthand, Old Testament shorthand. You know, OTSH? It was the OTSH class. They had the little signs and banners up in the field saying, come to the OTSH classes. No. Where was it written? On their hearts. And then via the Spirit. He said, now write it. Have you ever seen the movie, The Book of Eli? You ever seen that movie? Yet? Oh, I see another. Well, it's kind of violent for a church movie. There's some areas. Well, oh, but the Bible's pretty violent, so maybe. <laughs> the Book of Eli, Denzel Washington, is stuck in the, he's stuck in the future. Okay? Is he in the airplane? Yeah. No. And he has in his possession the book. The last copy of the book and there's a bad man that wants it well what you don't know is through the whole movie he fights and he's protecting and he does all this and all of a sudden the bad man gets the copy of the book and you think he's defeated because he's been trying to protect this book so no one would get it so that he could restore it down the road for those future generations but he loses the book and the man, the bad man, played by Gary Oldman, gets the book and he's so excited. He's been going after the book for like 20 years. He finally gets the book and he opens it up and it's in Braille. The only one who can read it is blind. And Eli was blind the whole time. They, they don't reveal that at the beginning of the movie. So at the end of his life, he goes on to, I think it's Alcatraz or something, a location, somewhere that's in, and anyway, they bring him and he reads what he memorized. And they rewrite it. And then, of course, then it says the King James Version. I thought that was kind of funny. But anyway, when God's word is written on your heart, you don't forget it. You don't. You know it. I'll never forget. If you ask me for bread, I will not give you a stone. That will be written on my heart for the rest of my life. I'll never forget that scripture. But here he's telling us that look, 
Before right now, I have made it available, all that you need to know. And through the Spirit, He delivered it. He didn't say through a writer I delivered it. Through the Spirit, I delivered it. Now watch this. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. Notice the separation right there. That we might know the things freely given to us by God. God is a God of grace. Freely we receive. Thus, freely we give. Which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural man, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them. Why? Because he's spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no man. Men today have a desire to appraise you. Matter of fact, you sometimes can't even move forward unless, you, unless you've been appraised by them. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he should instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Everything that we need is right here. So between this book and the spirit that is within us, we have everything that we need. That's why the end of Revelation says don't add or take away to it. Because it's not right. Everything you have and need is right here. As we previously studied, God exists as three distinct persons who are co-equal, co-infinite, co-eternal, and they all possess the same essential nature. We've already covered the essence of God, which is all the attributes. Spent many, many weeks on that, so we're not going back. But I do want to bring to remembrance one passage, Psalm 110. Psalm 110, verses 1. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for, their, for, for thy feet. Go to John 10. Where's your Bible, brother? We gotta give you one. Not you. We can't increase that speed unless you're roaming through. John 10. Verse 1. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. Who's the door? Jesus. Anyone who comes any other way is a robber and a thief. We know. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Each member of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, although separate, they individually possess identical eternal attributes. God is one essence, but three in persons. 
We have studied God the Father already. We've studied God the Son already. Now we turn our attention to the person of God the Holy Spirit. Each person of the Godhead has a specific purpose related to the eternal will and plan of God. This special study of the person and work of the Holy Spirit cannot and will not be more important than the teaching of the others. And we have learned over the last year now, and I believe I've proven it beyond a shadow of a doubt, that the Bible tells us everything we need to know. And it is written all we need to know. And what is not in there is not necessary. Many times, we take what's outside of the Bible and say it's a part of the Bible. The Bible says God helps those who help themselves. Bingo. It doesn't exist. So I'm not trying to change your tradition. I'm not. One of my old pastors used to say, I'm not trying to pee in your Kool-Aid. To many people, when you teach things, that, that go against what they learn or have learned, they shut you off. So if at any time you want to shut me off, you, can, you have the free will to do that. But I'm only going to present the word to you in its rawest form. If you decide that you want to help yourself, help yourself. God helps those who help himself. If you want to do it, go ahead. But it's about others. We know that. We know that our spiritual life and all that we do is for others, not for ourselves. Now watch this. When we read God's word, an interpretive method is used to understand what God is saying. There are passages in the Bible that, as I said, are gray, not are black and white and simple. The Lord will not change. I do not change, thus says the Lord. That's as black and white as you can get. But sometimes there are passages that are not so clear. We might use a different interpretive method in our mind. You might not have ever thought of interpretive methods, but I promise you after we're done with today, you will look at how you read the Bible in a whole different way than you might. I don't know about maybe Judy, being that you know she walked with the one who wrote it. Um, that's a joke. I like that joke. That's a funny joke to you. She's got wisdom and experience. But she too is here to learn. Otherwise she wouldn't be here. You know how many churches she's been a part of? Many. She only, I'll never forget the day she called me and said, I'm dried up. I said, we'll get some water. <laughs> she was dried up because she wasn't being taught anymore. She was to the point where she was not saying, I need to be taught new things. And I think your crazy Yankee butt can do it. Otherwise, she wouldn't be here. You think she has time? She's running out of time. If anything, she could be doing something else today. But instead, she chooses to come to hear the word of God and not water down. She wouldn't waste her time. Now, I don't have all the answers. I'm not God. And I'm certainly not perfect. But when I sit down with the Lord and say, okay, Lord, what do you want the congregation to know today? She knows that I'm not going to him like, well, what do I have to do now? What's the next thing, Lord? I'm, you know, I could be watching TV right now. No, she knows I take it seriously because I need to present it accurately. Otherwise, she'll call me on it. I know she will. I trust me. When I teach something that she might not understand or has gone against her, I'll get a message within six hours. And I don't have a problem with that because if I am truly studying, I can defend what I preach. With the word of God. See, I don't have to tell you the Bible's real. I didn't write it. It stands on its own. But because it comes out of my mouth, you have the right to say, well, I really don't read it that way. Well, you really don't even know how you really read it. That's what I'm telling you. You've never thought in your mind, how do I read the Bible, Pastor? I'm about to tell you how you read it. I'm about to bring some truth 
that most places won't teach because they don't want to be found as teaching in a different way than really the way they should. I'll explain in a moment. In fact, everything we see and everything we do uses an interpretive method. In a conversation, we interpret not just by the words spoken, but we also use the speaker's body language to interpret. For an example, I love being married. <laughs> Honey, how do you do it? I'm fine. Did I do anything wrong? No. <laughs> it might not be that I did anything wrong. She might be telling the truth, but something else is bothering her. I'm asking her, are you okay? Because she might be thinking, uh-oh, he's going to think he did something wrong. But if I ask her, honey, is, is, is something bothering you not relating to me? Ah, now she has context. But I don't say that. Is everything okay, honey? I'm fine. Or my favorite. I'm fine. Wham! Not that she does that. I'm using an example. I don't want you to get around and crush the pants. She doesn't slam things around very much. <laughs> very much. Not at all, probably. I can't. If I stood Not up at here, all, probably. If I stood up here and said she was a perfect angel, I don't think any of you would believe me. Because we only have one perfect angel. So I can't lie behind the pulpit. But you can always tell from their body language. I love seeing people out in the field who know they haven't been to church. And they see me. They see me from far away because I'm a big guy. And instead of walking forward, they do this quick step to the right to try and get out of my way so I don't see them. I can't tell you how many times I see someone. And, and I just say, hey, how are you? And they think I'm saying, why haven't you been to church? I say nothing about church. I just ask them, how are you doing? I've been thinking about you. Oh, and they start making up all these excuses of why they haven't come to church. I didn't ask you that. If I want to know why you're not at church, I'll ask you, why aren't you at church? I'm not going to beat around the bush. But what you say and what you do is all done based upon someone's interpretation, whether if you know it or not. So as you read the Bible, you're reading the Bible with your own method of interpreting what you're going to read. With God's Word, there are only two methods that people use. Write these two down. I'm going to give you the letters first, and then I'll say the word. Now, I'm teaching you some theological words here, okay? Remember how I started off saying how Paul didn't come with... Big fancy words, but I need to give you a few because you need to understand them. They're important. Otherwise, I wouldn't give them to you. E-X, E-G, E-S, I-S. E-X, E-G, E-S, I-X. Exegesis. Not J-E-S-U-S. -S, exegesis, if you prefer. I'm from the north, so we sound everything out real funny. Exegesis. Or E I S E G E S I S. Exegesis or eisegesis. Exegesis is defined as reading out of the scriptures. Reading out. So, X, A, uh, Jesus equals reading out. <coughs> Again, I'm not an artist. This is supposed to be a Bible. Oh, yeah, that does not mean a Bible. How do I write a Bible? Um, a book. Fine. Just for right now, this is a moment. I was trying to get 3D. I was trying to draw it laying down. But that's just, it doesn't look right. Exegesis means reading out of the Bible. Eisegesis 
is defined as reading into the Bible. Now, you've been taught one or both of those. There is a right way and there is a wrong way. But if you've never learned it, you don't know. But it's true. Some incorporate a little of both. Unless you've gone into seminary to study this, you're really not aware of it. Or critically aware of your method of reading and studying scripture. Both methods are used to some degree, though a person learns more heavily toward, leans heavily towards one or the other. We already know from Revelation 22, we find the term exegesis as God's interpretation of the correct method to read and understand his word. This means that we come to the table to allow God's word to define our theology. Revelation 22, 18 says, don't add to or take away. So if you can't add to or take away from something, well, then what are you supposed to do? Read it as it is. That's hard for people to do. Turn with me to 2 Timothy. Chapter 3. Starting in verse 16. Only the scriptures in red. No, it doesn't say that. Only the scriptures in the Old Testament. No, only the scriptures in the New Testament. No, only the scriptures that we like to read to take advantage of you. No, all scripture from the beginning of Genesis, from in to I want to say amen but I could be wrong but again see we don't want to read into it or read out of it let's look it is amen in and amen from in to amen is inspired by God that's what 2 Timothy 3.16 says all scripture is Inspired. Inspired is the word theonuton. By God. It gives truth something that we can believe. Inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction. For training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequately equipped for every good work. All scripture is inspired. Why is it inspired? It's inspired so that we can use it for reproof, for correction for training, and for instruction in righteousness. That's what makes it like no other book. The Bible's the only word that has that kind of power. And it is through the Holy Spirit that it was written. And many people will argue with you. Well, the English says this, or this translation is right, or that translation is wrong. All Scripture is inspired by God and it will never return void. If you are to love God, you must know who and what He is. You only find that by the inspired Word of God. You can only know God, only to the extent that you know what God has revealed about Himself and His Word. As we previously learned, God presents all truth, where? Through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. It's what it says. Again, I have to build this foundation, Judy. 
Because once I built this foundation and we begin to go into the gray, we will be able, by using the spirit of truth, to discern what is gray. How do you know a spade's a spade? Well, because you were taught what a spade is. What a concept. As we learned previously, through that, it said through the Spirit. So without the Spirit, you won't understand it. You've got to have the Spirit. As you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, through the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit, you will develop the capacity to love God and the motivation to serve and honor Him more than you ever have before. Within the next months, as I told you, there were nine innings or nine subjects we were going over. The personality of the Holy Spirit. Is anybody not here when we covered those? Or were you all here? You were all here for them. The deity of the Holy Spirit, the representations of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit revelation and inspiration, the Spirit's ministry in the Old Testament, the Spirit relation to Christ, the sin against the Holy Spirit, the baptizing and dwelling and filling work of the Holy Spirit, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We will start today on the personality of the Holy Spirit. Now this is not a complete teaching on the personality because part of the personality is found later on. So the first third of the personality we'll cover today. And then as we unravel all of this teaching, you'll see I'll cover specific points relating to more of the person of the Holy Spirit. This is more of a general overview of the personality of the Holy Spirit. Write this down. His identity confirms his personality. His identity confirms his personality. So how can you confirm his personality? By his identity. How, what do we know what his identity is? Well, the Bible tells us. I'm about to make a joke, so it's a joke. I'm precursoring it first. Please turn to the Book of Mormon. Please turn to the Quran. You can't find the identity of the Holy Spirit in any other book than in the Bible. Matter of fact, no other religious book in history talks about the Spirit of God. What does that tell you? But you never thought about that before, did you? No other religious book talks about the Holy Spirit but the Bible. Genesis 1. Oh, no, not again. You're bringing us back to Eric. I thought we were done with it. <laughs> oh, that's 126. We're never done with Genesis. Never. It's a beginning, even though it's not a beginning. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Our image, not just God's image, not just Jesus' image, not just the Holy Spirit's image, but all three. So we are made, we are identified with all three. That's how we know he is a person, the Holy Spirit. The problem in the minds of many people today is that personality can only exist in human beings. As though personality can relate only to infinite, or to finite, by finite beings, but not infinite. Since man is made in the image of God, it is reasonable to expect similar characteristics between God and man. If we are made in his image, then that means that we get to share the likeness of God. Personality can be defined as possessing the following. Intellect, knowledge, Emotions and will. 
The Holy Spirit has intellect, knowledge, emotions, and will. Now I know because of communion. He's giving us a warning. I'm going to try and keep this as short as possible without taking away from what it is that you came here for. Personality can be defined as possessing. So if we're saying the Holy Spirit has a personality, then that means if that is true, then the Bible will tell us that it's true. You understand? I'm not just saying the Holy Spirit has a personality because it sounds popular or it sounds cool. Oh, the Holy Spirit has a personality. No, it really, he really does. And the Bible is so clear on this personality. Now, why is this important? Because if you know that the Holy Spirit has a personality, then that means later today, when Manning goes back to throw that touchdown to put a nail into the coffin of Seattle, and you jump up and down and cheer, yay, yay! And the Holy Spirit within you says, calm down. You don't get that excited for me. I'm sorry, I love you, you know that. But ouch, the person of the Holy Spirit, Judy, comes alive, doesn't it? You know, you've seen it time after time again. And he says, you can sit here and watch three hours of this show and you get impatient after 30 minutes of preaching? Well, not in this church, because I've never prayed 30 minutes. But you're right. That's You want to see the person of the Holy Spirit? Right there. That's a glimpse of it. But I said, what were the things? Intellect, knowledge, emotions, and will. By demonstrating that the Holy Spirit has all these, it will also be shown, and when I'm speaking kind of futuristic, because you cannot and will not, nobody can teach accurately the Holy Spirit in 30 minutes. You can't. We've got it. We, huh? It's impossible, right? It is. It, it truly is because to be able to under, for example, if I were to tell you just about the last year of my life and what I've been through, it would take me at least two hours. Right. And I'm not God. So it's probably going to take us three months to get through. Right. I don't know. It could be less. It could be more. I have no idea. Right. But we have got to be patient with this so we understand. You're not just sitting here for no reason. And not everybody can handle this truth. They don't want to. And your knowledge or your relationship with the Holy Spirit will develop every year that you have the Holy Spirit. Well, it's like a pair of shoes. At first, if they're not very comfortable. How many women buy a pair of shoes and they're not comfortable? But after they've worn them a couple times, it kind of, you know, settles, you know? Men buy shoes, I had to do that too. <laughs> Misunderstand. So by demonstrating that the Holy Spirit has all these, will also be shown that He is a person and has a personality. The Holy Spirit is sometimes referred to as it, or a thing, or simply just as an influence. <laughs> I'm guilty of it myself. We will be demonstrating that the Holy Spirit is not just an influence, but a person, having the characteristics of a personality. <laughs> Early in church history, and go back and look for yourself, don't believe me, you know, this is probably what I've criticized at most, is calling a spade a spade, presenting facts that speak of history. It's amazing. Early in church history, Arius denied the personality of the Holy Spirit. Who's Arius? I'm not going to go into who Arius is. We don't have time. He said the Holy Spirit was only an influence emanating from the Father. He was condemned at the Council of Nicaea in 8325. His teaching continues to the present time in Unitarianism, Unitarianism, 
and in the Jehovah's Witness denomination. Let's turn our attention now to his intellect. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. Now, I know I said 1 Corinthians, so I need to make sure I stay in 1. 1 Corinthians 2. Repetition is the mother of learning. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. Remember this? Now, I didn't stop in this next word because I knew we were coming here. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. Searches. For searches. Searches. Now, you're thinking right now, searches like if you lost something and you have to find it. The word search here means to examine or investigate a matter. More like if you search a book to find a fact that you need. It isn't that you lost something. Exactly. We, when we see English words, we think of it in such a way that something was lost. Here it's not. The Holy Spirit examines the depths of God and reveals them to us. So it isn't like when we read this, we're reading something that is lost. It's not. It's here. But we don't have it. So by us examining it, so if you look back at that passage again, for to us, for to who? Us. God revealed them. Who's them? Who's them? You see? No, it just can't be that. I'm Who's them? Who? Those who are outside? The question is, who is them? What have I taught you? What have I taught you about reading scripture? What do we have to look for? Context. Do we know who them is right now? No. Any idea who them is, Judy? Who them is? The Corinthians. The Corinthians. Why do we know that them is the Corinthians. Because what's the book? Corinthians. Corinthians. Who is Corinthians written to? The church of Corinth. The church is referring to those who are believers. He's trying to get them past the elementary things into advanced teaching. But they're babies. They're not ready. They can't. But it says, For to us God revealed them through the Spirit. Who is us? We already talked about them as the Corinthians church. Who's us? Those have been chosen by God, the apostles of this time. God revealed to them the truth. Right? We take it today, don't we, Judy? As he's revealing it to us right now, fresh and clean. It's not. He's saying, I revealed to them. I revealed to us, them, <laughs> us, the apostles. Right. He revealed to the apostles so they could reveal it to the Corinthians so that when we read it, we can see what was revealed then. Not now. Then. I'm telling you, that's what this says. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. Look at the last part of verse 9. All that God has prepared for those who love Him. I'm sorry, uh, who's those do you think they're talking about? The Corinthians? No. You know why I know it's not? Do you know why, Jimmy? This is a quote from an Old Testament book. He pulls this out. Because look at verse 9. But just as it is written, he's referring to an Old Testament passage. So we're reading something new that's something old, but that's new if you've never looked at this before. What? But it's truth. I share that with you because this is one example of how Scripture 
has been turned for the benefit of whoever wants to read. How many times is scripture used against you? Why? Submit to your husband. If that's all you say, her first response is going to be, I do, but how about you? <laughs> See, she can say that. You know why? Her actions. Because she, she has a choice at all times. She doesn't have to submit herself to me. She can submit herself to anyone. But because she understands scripture, and she understands context. She understands that by submitting herself to me, she's submitting herself to God. She can say, I'm sorry, I don't need to submit myself to you. I'm going to submit myself to God. And wrong. It's wrong. Not because I say so. Right. She should submit herself to God. But she's got to submit herself to me and then herself to God. But if I mistreat her, does that mean she stops submitting herself to me? No. God will deal with me. She knows God's stick is much bigger than her own. I have to use that as an example. Because as we go through these scriptures, we will see many times people have misapplied what the Bible says because they don't read context. When we go through this, just like I rightly divided this, saying who's those, who's them, Who's us? Man, that's important. Because if you don't know who this, them, them, now, where, and why, you're just going to... But in the past, you've already, that's already happened to you. I need to now take the spaghetti and slowly unravel it so we can put it in its proper space. That's very hard to do when you're 42 years old. It is. It's really hard because people don't want to submit to that. Those who are on YouTube who are listening right now, are, if they've kept it on this far, then they'll begin to realize what was taught on the scripture. But if you weren't here and all of a sudden you came in right. and I started with this passage, but didn't hear me explain it. Like, remember when I first went over the scripture earlier today? You just went right over it, didn't you? Like it wasn't even nothing. But we went back, and I, I had to, I wanted to stop as I was reading because that's my natural thing. I couldn't, I had to run through it so that we could get to this point so I could point it out. Okay. The Holy Spirit examines the depths of God and reveals them to believers. Even as the Holy Spirit knows the Father, so the Father knows the mind of the Spirit. Now we just read. We just read, now we have received, no, that's not, we read this over here, forgive me. Yes, I know, but I promise I turned the page. I was looking at something else. Oh, for to us, God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit, for to us, God, God revealed, right? So because God revealed them, through the Spirit, now we have a distinction between God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, which kind of leaves out God the Son, but it, it's not made to completely remove the Son. This is all about the Spirit that we're teaching on. So even as the Holy Spirit knows the Father, the Father knows the mind of the Spirit. Go to Romans 8. Verse 27. Again, watch what we read now. Let's slowly go through this to make sure that you understand. This is awesome. Romans 8, verse 27. And then I'm going to make a point, and then we're going to stop, because otherwise I've got two more pages to go, and we're never going to make it. I'm sorry. Verse 8, Romans 8, verse 27. I'm going to read it fast through, and then we're going to go back. And he knows who searches the hearts, knows the mind of the Spirit is, 
knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now that is a mouthful. And he, God the Father, who searches the hearts, why? Because he's a critic of thoughts and knows the intents of the heart, knows what the mind of the Spirit is. Oh, the Spirit has a mind. Intellect. Imagine that. Because he intercedes. Who's he? The Spirit. Intercedes for who? The saints. You. So if you do not have the Holy Spirit. Don't get it. Exactly. What a concept. According to the will of God. It is God's will. For you to know. So without the filling of the Holy Spirit, you cannot know. Now, many times, it is added, added, added in to Scripture. It's added in, not taken out. It's added into Scripture. That the spirit that you get when you're saved is not enough. You need more. It is. It's taught. But it says here, without the spirit, you won't know. It doesn't say the other spirit or spirits. Not even in the original. I checked to make sure that I wasn't going to put my foot in my mouth. It is clear. Super clear. I did. You can't. You cannot take out. You can take out what it says, but you can't put in what it doesn't say. You can't. You can if you want. But look out. You're going to get a plague the size of a big frog on your shoulder. That's one of the plagues. There's many. But you cannot put in. You can only take out. And right here, it says ex. I'm sorry, but it is here, just like it says. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. If he did not give us that Spirit to know what we need to do, we'd be lost. So you can't take a spiritual life of a believer and say, well, he hasn't gotten it yet. Because he's received it. God has given us everything we need at the moment. Remember the 40 grace gifts? We have everything we need to understand. But the problem is, it isn't that we don't want to understand. We can. We can understand every single, single thing that the Bible teaches. But the problem is, is that because some things that we learn are added to... It doesn't stay with us. But here he tells us. Because God searches our hearts. And he knows what the mind of the spirit will be. No. Is. That's not past tense. And that's not future tense. It's now. He knows what the mind of the Spirit is. Why? Because he intercedes for the saint. The Spirit's job, the personality of the Holy Spirit, is to intercede for us. Between who and who? And who else? Well, if the Spirit is within us, right? And Jesus Christ is sitting next to the God and you have God, then you've got God, the Father, the Father and the Holy Spirit. Now, if the Holy Spirit is within us, and we receive it at the moment of salvation, then what interceding does he possibly have to do? Just prayers? No. Wait a minute. What? These are really important questions. We don't think about what the Holy Spirit does. Well, it says he intercedes. What does he intercede? Oh, 
Just that question alone we could stop. <laughs> the problem is though, you might forget. So next week I'm gonna we're gonna go back this one passage and come. I gotta rebring you in because this opens up a whole can of worms. What does he intercede, Judy? What have we been taught that the Holy Spirit intercedes? Now we know Jesus, he intercedes, right? And we've heard all about Jesus interceding, but what does, and what does it mean to intercede? What do we think? Or what do we know? We're building seeds, I guess. Huh? We're building seeds. Oh, it intercedes? Intercedes? Yeah, intercedes. You see that? Out of all people. Intercedes. Very good. You didn't even know. That's not even right. That God used him. I thought Judy was going to say that. I didn't think he was going to catch that at all. He, he's the one he caught. Intercedes. I catch on, I catch on fast. Uh, we're going to look at the word intercede because we don't understand what intercedes right, right. mean. But it does have to do with intercedes. Not, but when you say that, they think C-E-D-E-S, not S-E-E-D-S. But there is a connection between the word seeds and the word intercedes. That will help us understand what he intercedes. Because we don't know what he intercedes. Is he interceding dirty jokes? No. Is he interceding recipes for good cheesecake? What does he intercede? We don't know. Right. And if we don't know, then what are we? What if we don't know? If, you're, if you don't know something, what does that make you? Ignorant, I guess. Huh? <laughs> yeah, but see, you know, if someone used that word ignorant, they might get mad. But the fact is, ignorance is not knowing something. Not that you're right. stupid. Right. It's you don't know. Right. I don't. We intercede for one another. To whom? God. Right? When we pray, we pray, Heavenly Father, why do we do that? Because that's what the Bible says. That's what Jesus said, that when you pray, do it like this. Our Father, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom. It's the only one. Do you know it's the only time that prayer is ever duplicated is when Jesus says it? But you got churches who every Sunday duplicate that same prayer thinking it means it's a type of prayer. But the fact is when we intercede for one another, we intercede to God for prayer. But there's more than that. Dang, I didn't want to stop right there. <laughs> Father God, we thank you so much for your faithfulness and for your love. We thank you for your truth. Father, we thank you for who you are. For you give us such a wonderful opportunity to get to know who you are. To know your truth. And for those who miss this teaching, Father, I, I'm glad we have Vimeo. <laughs> because many people need to know this, but they won't watch it. Not because they're ignorant, but they're prideful and they don't think they can learn anything. Father, I just ask that you give us strength and wisdom as we go through the rest of our day. We look forward to our teaching tonight. And Father, I just ask that you will uh, restore Ryan's health and uh, you'll make him available to come tonight. We can uh, do all that needs to be done for your plan and purpose. Restore him as he is at home. And we thank you so much and we love you and we ask these things in